If we look back on history, it doesn't take much to see Russia was always going to be a significant nation in the legacy of armoured warfare. Little would do more to betray this than one of its first such examples, the Tsar tank, a colossal oddity. This heritage would be cemented in steel and fire during the Second World War as nearly 80,000 T-34s would become the backbone of Soviet forces. The only tank to outdo this would be the iconic T-55, with over 100,000 models being built in total. This would eventually lead to the T-72 being the final tank produced in huge numbers, although much less than its predecessor, at 25,000. Its core design language remained up until the T-90 but the Russian government started to become aware that their tanks are really showing their age, and would decide it was time to build a replacement for its aging Soviet tank fleet. In 2015, at the Moscow Victory Parade, they would reveal their next hope, the revolutionary T-14 Armata. Breaking the mould of conventional tank design, the T-14 is truly a unique creation. It features a three-man crew with an unmanned turret, state-of-the-art sensors, a 125mm gun and a, a toilet. Yes, you heard that right. In the T-14, this feature is called its life support system. It allows the crew to not only eat and sleep inside the tank, but also take care of more serious business preventing the need for the crew to be vulnerable in zones of conflict. This is a great addition to the vehicle. One only hopes it is a reliable system that isn't prone to leaks, making ammunition only the second worst thing a shell can damage in the event of the tank being hit. The development for the T-14 is still largely classified, but there is a bit of a clear picture emerging over time. In the 2000s, Russia was toying with the T-95. It featured a 152mm cannon, crewless turret, and shared much in common with the T-14. It wasn't the exact prototype of the Yamata, but the similarities in design clearly show a close relation between the two, with the latter being planned to have a 152mm cannon, though currently it's still sticking to the 2A821M 125mm smoothbore for now. The T-14 was primarily made to address the issues faced with legacy Soviet tank designs such as the degrading numbers in Russia's possession, as well as poor storage conditions. It was clear that the largest country in the world could not simply rely on Soviet designs forever. They needed a new tank to replace these vast stocks. This wasn't just a matter of numbers either. The T-14 was made to amend a number of issues faced with the legacy Soviet vehicles, such as poor crew survivability in the event of an ammunition cook-off, poor ergonomics, abysmal reverse speed, and much more. It's of no secret that older models had the habit of going out in a fairly explosive manner. This was caused by the autoloader's carousel being fairly exposed and easily set off, in the perfect position to send the turret to the moon, which is why many Western tanks employ a separate ammunition stowage compartment with blowout panels. To fix this first issue, the carousel is indeed still present, however it is likely now somewhat armoured like the T-90Ms. But to even further address this problem, the crew no longer sits on top of the ultimate hot seat. Instead, the entire crew sits in the very front of the vehicle with an armoured wall between them and the turret, with said turret being completely remote controlled from the front compartment. This didn't stop the risk of the turret popping off in the event of an ammunition burn, but it means the crew will survive and the vehicle could in theory be returned to friendly lines and repaired, although this would of course not be a simple task. It has been seen in recent events how vehicles that can be repaired and crews that can be reused can balance the scales in a numerical standoff. So, is it any good? Well, as always, tanks are hard to judge honestly, and until it sees much use, this won't truly be known. But we can look at indicators of performance, starting with mobility. The Amata has a power to weight ratio of 30 horsepower per ton, which is pretty high as few MBTs go beyond about 27 horsepower per ton. In addition, the T14 has an automatic electronically controlled gearbox meaning that it can drive as fast forward and backward. This is a big improvement over the previous tanks Russia has been fielded with their awfully sluggish reverse speed. 
The T14 is driven by an engine that has, well, garnered a lot of attention. So we'll address that later in the detail it truly deserves. The enigma surrounding the T14's armour lies in a scarcity of disclosed information. The composition of its construction materials remains unknown to observers. The extent to which composite alloys overlay basic hardened steel, for example, remains a mystery. The specific arrangement of the Amata's armour, whether it employs spaced plates, rubber layers, or tungsten components, remains undisclosed. Details about armour distribution across the tank's frontal section, unmanned turret, and hull sides also remain undisclosed. Finally, crucial details about the Amata's innovative Malachit era, its weight, thickness, explosives, and metal plate composition remain veiled in secrecy. It may seem pretty obvious. Most vital information to discuss the armour is just not known. There is no conclusive opinion of the Armata's protection to any credible source outside of those allowed by the development team. So, I'm afraid I can't tell you if it's good or bad. But we can use what we know about the application of different levels of armour to build a bit of a potential picture. The Armata's dimensions are quite imposing. With a hull stretching approximately 8.7 metres in length and boasting a width of around 3.5 metres. This places it firmly in the larger category among main battle tanks, dwarfing even the mighty M1 Abrams, which has a hull length of 7.9 metres. Surprisingly, despite its bulk, the Amata tips the scales at a comparatively modest 50 metric tons. This is notably lighter than the M1A2 Abrams, which commands a weight of approximately 65 tons. While some of the weight reduction can be attributed to the T14's more compact turret, it fails to account for the substantial 15 to 20 metric tons that remain unexplained. While it's possible to incorporate lighter armour materials, as exemplified by designs like the French Leclerc and Japanese Type 10, such solutions come at an exorbitant cost and don't offer the same level of armour protection as heavier tungsten and deleted uranium configurations. The Amata likely achieves its relatively lightweight, considering its substantial size, by making significant sacrifices in armour protection. It seems that the T-14's crew capsule receives robust frontal armour, potentially around 1,000mm of rolled homogenous armour, as claimed by the Russians, albeit at the expense of side, rear and turret shielding. It's also fair to assume that the whole sides of the Amata rely heavily on explosive reactive armour and the tank's hard kill active protection system for defence against high explosive anti-tank warheads. This vulnerability is particularly pronounced when facing tandem and triple charged heat warheads, as well as top down EFP munitions, but only time will tell how this tactic works out. Prioritising crew survivability is definitely a large shift in doctrine from the Soviet tanks of old. We've discussed protection, so let's talk about how it means to defeat the protection of its foes. The gun the T-14 currently uses is the aforementioned 125mm smoothbore, and it's possible this could be changed to the 2A83 152mm gun. This could help Russia from being outmatched by Western rounds, which has begun to be a bit of a problem of the ageing designs that currently make up the vast majority of Russia's stock. It's worth noting, the T-14 has access to the depleted uranium vacuum one round, which is alleged to penetrate up to a metre of armour at 2,000 metres at zero degrees. But only time will tell if this is to be true. If this is the case, the T-14 is a threat to essentially anything that it comes across and would be perfectly adequate for operations in Ukraine, despite that not happening for reasons we'll get to shortly. When it comes to the fallacy, it's not just the gun that we must talk about, but also the eyes that aim said weapon. The Amata's gunner sight maxes out at 12 times magnification, allowing the T-14's gunner to spot a tank-sized target at around 5 kilometers in favorable daytime conditions, and approximately 3.5 kilometers at night. In stark contrast, the M1A2 SEPS gunner sight reaches an impressive 50 times magnification. So this still puts it on the back foot in some areas, as even the finest gun won't be of much use if your adversaries manage to spot and strike you first 9 times out of 10 due to subpar sights and lackluster ballistic computers. That said, this could be changed and would almost undoubtedly be the case if the new 152mm gun is fitted to the tank as planned. It does seem to show, however, that Russia is still lagging behind the West when it comes to optics in some regard. 
as mentioned earlier, there is some controversy in regards to the heart of the Yamata, and that is of course its engine. The reason for the X engine is in itself logical. The benefit of such engine layouts allows smaller dimensions for the power provided, something of much use in an armoured vehicle that requires up to and exceeding a thousand horsepower while having limited space. The con of that is, X engines are both hard to engineer successfully due to their rarity as well as difficulty in working on them. Now, if you weren't aware, there's a bit of a rumour that the T14 Armata uses a German World War II era engine, with minimal changes made. As something of an automotive enthusiast myself, I'm going to avoid the messy historical perspective on this engine and simply focus on the clear engineering view to determine the reality of this situation. Engines are a complicated topic, and to those that aren't in the know, it's easy to get these things confused, come to the wrong conclusion, and so on. But this is fine. It requires a certain level of technical knowledge to be able to recognise the importance of certain differences in what makes one engine unique from another. With this, we can assess the core engineering that makes this engine either the same or different from the German World War II SLA-16 engine from an objective position. The SLA-16 is an engine developed by Porsche during the Second World War intended to be fitted into a number of German big cats. The T14 engine that is believed to be essentially a copy of this is the A85-3, also often called the 12N360. So how do they compare? There are some similarities between the two engines, both are X engines, both are turbocharged and both are diesel engines but that seems to be about where the similarities end. The most contrasting differences between the two is that the T14 engine is actually an X12 engine, whereas the SLA was an X16, but that isn't where this ends. Both engines have completely different displacement, power output, compression ratio, bore, dimension, crankshaft type and more, as shown here. The reality is, there may have been inspiration or lessons learned from the SLA16 but there are simply so many differences that it's simply not true to say that these engines are exactly the same. To make an example of how this engine is different, take the BMW M78 327 engine from 1933. It is a 2 litre inline 6 engine. This, for example, is not the same engine used in the Nissan R32 GTR, a car of a 2.5 litre inline 6, as the compression ratios, fuel injection, forced induction and pretty much everything between these two engines are completely different. It would be unrealistic to say the Nissan iconic R32 GTR uses a 1933 BMW engine just because it's an inline 6 with 2 point something litres. The T14's engine is simply unique, but the matter of its X12 engine is still one that brings a question of reliability. X engines are generally known for being hard to get right and often unreliable but this isn't to say the T14's engine is bad. There are good X engines out there, but it's more of a potential issue than fielding a V12 for example, as many tanks have found to strike the perfect balance. So while the engine gets a lot of attention, it really will take some time to see how good it actually is. For all we know, it could turn out to be a huge issue for the T14, or it could be a brilliant engine. It's just too early to tell. The engine would not be the only controversy facing the Armata, as on its first parade, it appeared on, it suffered a breakdown. It's not clear exactly what happened, with the consensus being the driver engaged the brake system, which does seem most likely given the towing vehicle struggled to make it even move as we can see from the footage, followed later on by the T14 moving through its own power. In this very case, it seems more like a user error, though you would hope it isn't an easy mistake to make, given this happening in combat would not be ideal. This incident, while not great reputation wise, doesn't really say much about the T14's reliability and it would not be wise to judge it from that. As much of a bad look as it may seem, new tanks have issues. New crews too. It's important not to underestimate what could be a true threat to modern western armour, that is, if it wasn't for one fatal flaw production. The T14 appears, at least at face value, to be a pretty promising tank. Its protection systems combined with protected crew and increased mobility, not to mention the possibility of a 152mm gun, looks good, 
but it's all for naught if the tank is never produced in meaningful quantities. Throughout the years, promises surrounding the T-14 Armata tank's production have echoed, but tangible results have proven elusive. In 2016, the Russian Defence Ministry foretold a test batch of 100 tanks to be delivered in 2020. However, this was stretched to 2025. By 2018 though, Deputy Prime Minister Yuri Borisov altered course, pressing that T-72s were good enough, and modernisation of such existing tanks was then prioritised over large-scale Armata production. The 2018 contract at the Army 2018 Forum seemed to breathe fresh life into the project. With 32 T-14 tanks and 100 T-15 infantry fighting vehicles set for delivery by 2021, yet the wheels of production once again turned much slower than anticipated. By February 2019, the promise of delivering even a dozen tanks by year-end had fallen flat. And come November 2019, the initial forecast had slipped, postponing deliveries to late 2019 or early 2020. Into 2020, Rostex Head noted in mid-January that no Amata platform vehicles had been delivered. In February, the CEO of Ural Wagonzavod adjusted expectations, indicating the Amata platform armour would commence operational evaluation in 2020, with full contract completion sliding to 2022. As the calendar turns, there is a lingering air of uncertainty whether state trials of new ammunition loaders projected to conclude in 2022, with delivery of more than 40 Armata tanks is optimistically slated post-2023. The repeated assurances and subsequent delays underscore a growing concern that Russia's tank production abilities are not at the level required to replace its legacy Soviet stocks, and to make the T-14 anything more than a propaganda tool. In conclusion, the T-14 Armata itself is promising on paper, but if it isn't produced in meaningful numbers, then it may be a failure. So far, it's not looking very good, but perhaps this will change in time. For now though, it's not looking good for Russia's future of tank production, and the old reliable T-72 will be modernised to the end of time. If you'd like to see a video on Russia's latest modernised T-72 B3, or any other tank for that matter, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching, I've been Kubota, and I'll see you next time.